I'm Valerie, and 155 years ago today, on February 11, 1862, Elizabeth Eleanor Siddle Rossetti died. In a lot of ways, we hear more about Lizzie's death than we do about her life, and usually that's something I push back against. With Unvarnished, I really wanted it to be her telling us her words her view of things from inside this life that had so many stories told about it from the outside. And obviously, I can't really be inside that life. It's still going to be me telling it from the outside, which is the irony of all of it. And that's something that I deal with a lot in the play about how the immortality of the muse means you live on in other people's images, in other people's stories, and how what it would be like to know that as you're going through your life, as you're looking at the way that people tell your life even while you're still alive, which must have been very, very strange. Lizzie's death is the center of one of the stories that we hear about the most, which is the story of her exhumation seven years after her death. A couple of years ago, I bought this necklace on Etsy from an artist named Aurora in Sweden. And it is a watercolor that depicts the legend of Lizzie's hair continuing to grow in her coffin. And it's a bit ghoulish, but I love it. It's a beautiful piece, a little macabre. A couple weeks ago, the same artist on her deviant art, which is Jevful, D-J-E-V-F-U-L, I'll put a link in the description, posted an absolutely beautiful pen and ink portrait of Lizzie with this wonderful challenging expression that reminds me a lot of her self-portrait. She's looking back out at you, yeah, reduce me. I dare you, is kind of what the feeling that I got from it. And the symbol of the dove and the poppies are double-edged swords that kind of followed Lizzie all through her adult life and through her journey as a muse, as an artist. The dove goes back to a way that Gabriel described her once as a meek, unconscious dove, and it's always been a really peculiar phrase to me, the way that everyone in the Peruvian circle used words, I mean, was a little bit off from what we expect even from Victorians and the idea of unconscious. What does he mean by that? He doesn't mean that she's, you know, out cold. And it's, you know, I've always gotten the impression that it means unselfconscious, unprepossessing maybe. You know, it, what's contained in that word is a little difficult to get hold of, which is what happens when you're dealing with poets who make their own reality. Meek, unconscious dove, you know, like you're holding this dove in your hand, and it just has always rubbed me the wrong way. And yet, it's not something that she seems to have taken exception to, at least overtly. Um, he refers to her as his dove constantly in letters. He'll draw a little pictogram of a dove to represent her name in his letters to her and his letters to other people. And knowing that she had a temper, that she had very strong opinions, that she had quite a strong will of her own, the tension of that image is so strange. And yet that image comes back. You have the dove over her head in the damn little Saint Grail. And of course you have the dove that's delivering the poppy into her hand in Beata Beatrix. Beata Beatrix is one of those things that also would not exist without Lizzie's death. There is a study from before her death with a pose very similar to the one that you see in the many versions of the painting. That is probably the study that he used, although you know, legend has it again that he knew her face so well at this point he could paint it from memory. One of the things I actually liked about the historically quite cavalier, as we have discussed before, Desperate Romantics, is the scene where he's painting Beata Beatrix. And he goes to start and he cannot call her face to mind. She's lying in state right next to him in the studio, which is weirdness all of its own. And he goes and he searches through all of his sketches and the guggums and the studies that he has done of her and he fixes her face in his mind and he starts to paint. And it's just, it's this beautiful little montage that 
even though obviously the real painting was not done in a night while she was lying in state next to him because bleh, it's, it's this wonderful poetic elision of the living, breathing wife to this image that he created that he went back to multiple times. The one that lives here in Chicago at the Art Institute of Chicago, which is the one that I'm familiar with, the only one I've seen in person, was commissioned in 1871. And the thing that I love about that one, aside from the fact that it's the one that I've seen in person, is it has the predella at the bottom of Dante and Beatrice meeting in paradise. And it sort of, the, the, the tension between those two pieces really kind of expands on the story. And the Beatrice in, in the main painting of that doesn't look much like Lizzie, and the Beatrice in the meeting in Paradise really doesn't look much like her at all. It looks somewhere between Jane and Alexa, I would say. This was the period where his idealized female figures were starting to become kind of an amalgam of all of these women. And, which is one of the reasons that if you say, go on Instagram and look at the Lizzie Siddle tag, half of the top uh, results will probably be Alexa, who deserves her own name and her own, own life, and that's a rant for another time. But back to Beata Beatrix, you have the dove, which is the symbol of this idealized image of Lizzie, and you have the poppy, which it's a white poppy in the first couple versions of the painting. And the dove is red, the color of love. And so you have love delivering this white poppy that means peace, that means fidelity. There are a lot of different symbols bound up in that. And layered underneath that, of course, you have the poppy is the source of the laudanum that was its own double-edged sword all through her adult life and that which ultimately took her life. So you could, I, I just sit and look at these symbols and have it go over and over. Let me tell you, dis distilling those into words, into one varnish, this is why writing that play took so long. Because pictures are worth far more than a thousand words. And the way that the words have to be layered to make any kind of sense out of the symbols, out of the pictures, it's almost impossible to put them in a linear sentence structure sometimes. I think I got there. Hopefully you'll see soon whether I got there. Uh, the play does end at the point where she dies. And one of the big questions for me in writing, because a qu it's a question we'll never have a definitive answer to, is whether she did in fact mean to take her own life that night. And for the longest time I thought that I had to know the answers to those questions in order to write. And especially in order to write the ending of the piece because it's, it's her voice speaking directly to the audience. It stops at the point where her story no longer belongs to her, no longer can be told in her voice. And I had a challenge to make that not terribly depressing in addition to trying to decide what I thought was going through her mind that night. And I'm fairly pleased with what I found. We'll see. I am currently working on scheduling a second staged reading of the current version of the script, hopefully to be followed this year, really, by full productions. I'm working on costumes. I'm pulling together props. As they say in Hamilton, you have no control. Who lives? Who dies? Who tells your story? Lizzie had people tell her story who knew her, people who didn't know her, people who continue to tell her story who had no way of knowing her but through those stories like myself and we can only be as true as we can to what she means to us. And so on this day we have the dove, we have the poppy. We can wonder what would she have thought? What did they mean to her? What did they mean to the people who knew her? In the coming months, I am going to try to get back to updating this part of my vlog regularly. And so look for, on the 11th of each month, something about Lizzie, something about my production process, which is slowly but surely continuing. So thank you, all of you, for your interest. Thank you for sharing this journey with me. Thank you for sharing my interest in Lizzie. And until next time, 
Goodbye.